on the recording. Uh, so, uh, hi everyone. I'm uh, really happy to tell you welcome to our October Women Who Code event. Uh, Women Who Code uh, is an international organization who, uh, which uh, has uh, the mission and the vision to empower the women to excellent uh, in IT industry. And uh, that's, how, uh, that's why this evening we'll talk about the diversity and how uh, the women are integrated in uh, the IT industry. Uh, it's a big pleasure for me to present your Arashi, uh, who is a uh, head of diversity uh, and inclusion uh, team in uh, Uber. Uh, She's responsible for uh, uh, Uber uh, uh, across Europe, uh, the Middle East, and Africa, Asia Pacific, and the global Uber Eats business. Uh, originally, uh, she is uh, from India, but uh, during her childhood, she is uh, living like a digital nomad, and uh, she lives uh, across uh, the world with her, uh, her parents. Um, that's why uh, she uh, topic about the inclusion is really close to her and uh, she has uh, the touch from the first head the, the different uh, cultures uh, in the different uh, uh, continents and uh, countries uh, she's uh, traveling uh, a lot and uh, this is her passion uh, Rashi joined uh, Uber in uh, 2013 in uh, New Delhi, where she helped uh, to launch and build the brand in, brand in the region. She spent a few years uh, on Uber CMEA recruiting team, where she worked uh, on a number of projects, uh, ranging the employer branding to building the campus recruiting program. Today, she is uh, responsible for diversity and inclusion efforts uh, uh, and uh, to build inclusion inclusive uh, culture in Uber. Uh, uh, prior to, uh, to Uber, uh, she worked in uh, India's uh, television industry, making uh, uh, her mark as an executive producer for non-fiction shows. So, Ayashi, uh, nice to meet you and uh, welcome to our stage. Thank you, Raina. It's it's an absolute pleasure to be here. And um, hello, uh, good evening, I'm guessing, to, to most people or good morning based on where you are. Um, I'm really, really happy to to have this conversation. And um, if you if you all have any questions, um, please feel free to ask. It's a small group, so I think we can be super candid and, and transparent and we'd love to have a dialogue. But thanks for having me, Raina. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and uh, starting our uh, chat uh, with uh, my first uh, question, uh, what is uh, your personal point of view about the diversity and uh, how do you feel uh, in uh, the diverse world and working uh, in a uh, diverse environment? Yeah, I, I think, you know, you, you kind of touched upon it a little bit in my in my introduction. I don't know on a personal level, I don't know a world that isn't diverse. My whole life um, has been characterized by, um, by diversity. So whether that was, you know, growing up in different cultures, surrounded by different cultures, um, being exposed to different cultures and languages and food and art and, you know, um, to, to my life um, right now, especially in the past few years living in, in Europe, um, diversity has has always been a fundamental, you know, uh, uh, characteristic that I've, I've I've grown up with and and that I embrace. So I really don't know what it could, would be like to be in a homogenous um, environment because that's just not something that I've been very used to. Um, so I really thrive in 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 diversity, and I've seen and you know through my personal lived experiences the richness. Um, that you get when you're exposed to, to difference, which is diversity. Um, so, you know, whether it's, you know, as humans, when we're in a, in a diverse setting, so whether it's in a diverse team, as an example, you know, we work much harder 
right? Because we don't have that, that safety and that comfort of the sameness. So you end up just producing uh, much more innovative results. So why, you know, for me, those are, those are some of the reasons why um, one is that it's just been a part of my life and, and, and I've, I feel very fortunate about that. And the second is I've seen how outcomes can be so much better when you have diversity in the room. Um, yeah, it's uh, really true that uh, the diversity gives uh, some uh, different points and richness uh, for the teams uh, and uh, the people in the team. Um, but I, you know that uh, more of the people have uh, some bias, some of them conscious, some of them unconscious. Uh, how to win again against our bias? Uh, how yeah. to reject them and uh, cancel them? Yeah, and it's, it's a great question, right? I think I'll start off by saying, um, you know, we, we think of bias as a bad thing, right? And, and it's not always bad. Right. The first thing is the, the starting point is all of us, each and every one of us, myself included, we all have biases. Right. That's the fact, you know, you're able to build more awareness and you're able to build more rigor around uh, the way you think and the way you react towards that. So, as you said, right, there are there are unconscious biases sometimes ones that we will never know um, exist and play on in our minds because of the way our mind is wired. And at times there are some that are much more conscious, right? Um, and, and it really is, you know, in, in, in many ways, it's, it's very hard for you to combat against that, but there are some tips and tricks um, you can do to just build your own personal awareness. What I, you know, I, I, I share this with a lot of um, uh, my colleagues at Uber that I work with day in and day out on diversity and inclusion is, you know, one is just building um, your personal self-awareness. So whether that's, you know, through workshops or listening to podcasts or reading books, right? Um, a book that I always recommend to, to my team and, and colleagues is um, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And it's not a book of, on biases per se. He's an economist. And the book is more about thinking and how we make decisions, right? But when we make decisions as human beings, we most of the time default, depending on how, you know, what decision we're making, we either default to making it very quickly and decisions are ha happening when we're not even conscious, when we're not even aware of it, because that's just how much information we're taking in day in, day out. Um, and at other times you're, you're taking, um, you know, really thoughtful, slow decisions and you want to evaluate all the different um, options that you have. But what's interesting is that, you know, even when we're taking some of those slow decisions in business on, you know, team structure, on promotions, whatever that might be, you know, are we taking in those opinions from a diverse group of people or are we taking in those perspectives from one type of person? So I think one is, you know, just self-educating to, to your question, educating, building awareness is, is one piece. The second piece that I would say is, you know, when you're trying to make decisions, because most of the time bias plays in, in our decision-making day in and day out, um, especially if you're making a critical decision that's going to have an impact on people, product, things, um, try not to make that decision in a moment of chaos and conflict and being super stressed about it. And I know that's hard because our, our lives are so complicated, especially right now, but try and, you know, separate yourself a little bit from, from, from that situation so that you're able to be extremely intentional about that journey to that decision. And the third piece that I would say um, that I actually uh, use as well, because uh, you know we all have biases and I have my own personal biases is creating like a, 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 a almost like a support group, you know, a buddy system, someone who you can turn to, someone who you trust, but someone who will call you out for your behaviors, right? So when you when you know, especially for some decisions that might be a little, you know, you, you know, you have a conscious bias or you have a conscious prejudice against one thing or another, is just running some of those decisions by another person and saying, hey, do you think I'm making this decision because of that? Or am I seeing the full picture or not? So I think those would be my three, um, you know, three suggestions um, on, you know, on, on how do you combat um, and mitigate or disrupt 
um, you know, some of the biases that that exist in in our everyday lives. But it's hard work, right? It's it hard work. It's hard work, and it requires a lot of intentionality. Um, and it's it's a daily process, right? You you can never say I've become a master at it because things change, situations change, language in the world evolves. So you have to be doing it very very intentionally. Yeah, it's uh, really uh, difficult because, as uh, you say, uh, sometimes we uh, make uh, our decision based of our emotion in uh, the mm -hmm. concrete uh, situation. So yeah. this is the time to take a time and uh, mm -hmm. after that to, take, uh, to decide what we yeah. will do. Yeah, and uh, uh, this. Uh, process is um, very common uh, in the corporate and uh, what uh, what about uh, the diversity and uh, inclusion culture uh, culture in uh, the co corporate uh, you work uh, in uh, uber uh, i suppose that uh, you have a really good program uh, how to forest uh, diverse and uh, in diverse and inclusive culture on the workplace uh, how do you resolve uh, and how do you work on this topic? Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a good question. <clears throat> and and it's a, it's going to be a fairly long answer. So I'll try and break it up into into a few pieces. I'll, I'll take a little step back right now for um, for everyone. So for those of you, um, you know, who, who aren't aware, um, you know, at Uber, we, we set up our diversity and inclusion team, a formal team um, back in 2016. That's really was the starting point for us um, in a formalized way of building and talking about diversity and inclusion. But that doesn't mean that's that was the start of our journey because at Uber we already had something called employee resource groups since uh, late 2014, early 2015, and employee resource groups or ERGs as as they're commonly known as. Um, really are groups um, that are for employees by employees of employees, um, you know, on a specific topic or a specific identity coming together um, to, to discuss it, to, to work on it. And we had these groups from, from late 2014 in the organization, but talking a bit about more about, you know, our, our, our more structured journey 2017 onwards, um, it really has been, you know, starting from the basics as, as an organization, really understanding, you know, where, where is our culture at and where do we want to be as a company? And that's, that's been the journey that we've been on since then. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, I've, I've been on that team for since, since the very beginning and it's been really super exciting to see the progress that we've made in a fairly short span of time because this thing takes a lot of intention, it takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of different teams coming together to make things happen. So I, I you know, I, I, I say this to a lot of my stakeholders and leaders that I work with, you know, I'm not responsible for DNI at Uber. My team is not responsible for DNI at Uber. It's, it's the leaders, it's the employees who are responsible for making it happen and for living it day in and day out. My team can help guide can help advice, can help, you know, share practices and advice on what we should and shouldn't be doing. But truly, um, you know, diversity and inclusion is going to be successful in any company uh, when employees and leaders are living it in their values and the way that they approach topics every single day. Um, so I think when I think about diversity and inclusion and I'm, you know, speaking at Uber, but even more broadly, you know, outside of Uber, um, you know, it, it really is about how are you embedding it across the, the, the different aspects of your business. So for us at Uber, it really started with our people. Um, that was our beginning of our journey was how do, we, um, how do we embed a lens of inclusion across the entire employee life cycle? So from the time um, a prospective candidate looks at a job description to the time they're hired in the company, you know, they're onboarded, they're promoted there and then they exit you know what does that life cycle look like and how where are where are we seeing potential gaps or biases in our system how do we de-bias it and how do we make it more inclusive so that's really been the journey that we've been on in the last few years and more recently 
you know, as we've built a muscle on DNI within the company and within our leadership and our, and our employees, we've started talking about diversity and inclusion in our products and services in our marketplace. So, you know, we've we've been able to move from a very much employee only and internal facing agenda to a, a much more comprehensive and robust agenda across what we call our workforce, our workplace, and our marketplace. So that's really been the, the journey that we've been on um, as, as a company. Uh, you almost uh, replied to my next question, uh, how to implement uh, effective uh, diversity management strategy in the company. And I really believe that the executives uh, need to be involved uh, from day one. Uh, in uh, the initiatives uh, and the topic and to encourage uh, our uh, employees, not yeah. only uh, employees, but uh, managers uh, mm -hmm. of the employees uh, to encourage their team uh, to participate and to, to build this culture in their team. But uh, is there something uh, special how to build uh, this uh, diversity management uh, strategy? I believe that uh, some of uh, our guests uh, would like to know how to implement in their organizations some tip and, tip and tricks. <laughs> I wish, right? I wish there was like a, a playbook. Um, <laughs> frankly, it, 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 there, is, there are so many nuances to, to diversity and inclusion um, and the way that you look at it in, at the corporate uh, or even team level. But I think what you spoke about, right, leadership is, is, definitely, is definitely a very important factor, um, is making sure that your, your leadership team, your CEO, um, you know, your entire executive team is, is not just bought in, but they're actually leading the way, right? Because that gives um, employees, middle line managers, the, the signal that this is important and that they can take the time for making it happen and they can allow for their you know, teams to also invest in it. So I think that's one very, very critical piece in, in, in this conversation. However, if anyone's in a company where they don't think that their leadership team is fully engaged or committed, that shouldn't let you stop what you're doing, because there is also a lot of power in, in momentum and movement bottoms up, right? And I've seen that at Uber. So pre-2017, we didn't have the same buy-in from our executive team. Um, but we had a lot of bottoms up momentum from our employees who really wanted passionately to make change happen in the company. So yes, it's very important to have executive buy-in and absolutely in the long run, that's, that's going to be what sets you apart, but don't let the lack of that stop you from moving forward as employees, because there's a lot of power in, in movement and momentum. But if I can, if I can think of any tips and tricks, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to, you know, summarize it in, in, in a nutshell, but I would say, one is, you know, if you if you don't have a diversity and inclusion team on your in your company, don't let that stop you again. You know, work with your leaders, work with your HR teams, and understand, you know, what does our what does our workforce even look like? So data is extremely powerful, um, and knowing what that baseline is in the company. So what's representation? How many, you know, what does representation? Um, whether that's gender, whether that's race, ethnicity, whether that's another dimension of diversity, what does that look like broadly in our company? What does that look like across levels in our company? You know, in management, in mid management, and in, you know, individual contributor contributor roles. What does that look like? So start with start with understanding what what your representation is and seeing where the gaps exist, and start figuring out ways in which you can address that. And I think as employees, um, you know, there's a ton of different things that can be done, especially when it comes to building inclusion and engagement within, within the workforce. So that would be my, you know, my, my first starting point would be to look at data um, and ask for it. It's not always the easiest to get by, but definitely start asking for it so that you can help um, understand, you know, where are we starting from and where do we want to go? Yeah, uh, it's uh, really important the employees to be involved uh, in uh, the diversity uh, and the uh, diversity and inclusive culture in the company. Uh, but uh, in the 
last uh, year, so maybe we talk about a, a lot of uh, about the diversity. We have uh, goals, how to cover the diversity goals, uh, because they are important for our business. And um, some people uh, already reject and uh, don't want to know about the diversity. Uh, how to resolve uh, this problem and uh, do you know the other common uh, mistakes that the organization uh, doing uh, about the, the DNI and diversity and inclusion? So if I if I understood correctly, I know the first question is how do you how to, how to involve the colleague because uh, mm -hmm. now we talk about uh, a lot of uh, about the diversity uh, mm -hmm. but uh, they are not part of uh, any diverse group, minor group, mm -hmm. and uh, that's why uh, they don't want to include uh, in uh, the initiatives uh, and yeah. uh, how to find the balance uh, between uh, the passion about the diversity mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, regular. Yeah, advice. yeah, no, it's a great question. I think, um, you know, how. One is how do you, you know, there might be people within the organization. Sorry, there's a fly and I don't want to have like a Mike Pence moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, so one part is, right, how do you convert the people who are not engaged on DNI, right? How do you, how do you engage them if they don't want to be engaged? And frankly, my suggestion on this one is going to be go with the people who are engaged put your focus and your efforts and your energy on the people who are already engaged and who are already committed and start building the movement from them, right? That's not to say you shouldn't focus on the people who are not engaged, but my my general, the general way in which I do work is I focus on the people who are engaged and I'm, and I've seen this happen in, in, in a systemic way at an organization level, where once you start having movement and you start having momentum and you start having numbers, the people who are on the sidelines and they weren't really sure about this, start converting themselves and start seeing why this is super important. So my general advice is focus on the people who already care and build your movement from there and then the others will follow. And if they don't follow, right, that's okay. They, they might eventually drop off themselves because they might see that this is not the, the kind of culture that they want and they want to be a part of. And that's fine, right? You'd rather have people within your organization and your team who really care and are, who, are, who are really committed. So my personal advice is focus on the people who care and build from there. That doesn't mean you shouldn't engage, right? You should always try and engage with different groups. Um, and understand their point of view and hear where they're coming from. What I found very, very interesting, especially when we think about, you know, you spoke about people who might not identify as, as a minority, right? So you're thinking, you're talking about whoever's in, in, in that majority in that context, um, but how do you convert them into being allies, right? Most of the time, many people um, truly care. They have good intentions. 99% of the time people have good intentions and they truly care and they want to do something positive and they want to help, but they don't necessarily know how and they don't have the, the toolkit or the language um, to, to necessarily, or, or there, there's a lot of fear of saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing, right, right now. Um, I, my suggestion is reach out to them, right? Make it, um, if, if you truly want to reach out to them, make it comfortable for them, share resources, share listenings, share articles, share podcasts, so that they understand that there's a gap that might exist that they, if they bridge, they'll understand what they could do. So there's never any harm in, in having conversations and in, in being proactive in, in, you know, setting up time, you know, a Zoom coffee date or, you know, a Zoom uh, one one or, or small group session where you discuss a certain topic that may be of interest to other people, but they haven't necessarily explored it right now because there was a fear of saying or doing the wrong thing or the lack of, you know, awareness. Um, so that would be that would be my advice um, on on that one. I and I know structurally there's a ton of really cool programs as well um, uh, out there that you know companies and organizations can adopt 
on allyship itself. There are many um, really great um, you know, NGOs and, and research firms that are running allyship programs where you learn a bit more about how to be a good ally, which, you know, again, depending on you know, the life stage of your company and what you're looking for, um, you could potentially you know, create one of your own, create your own network within the organization as well. Uh, yeah, thank you for your uh, answer. And uh, you touched the topic about the alias, and uh, I take a chance uh, to ask you how to find uh, the best alias about the women, and uh, what is uh, your uh, opinion about the mentorship, sponsorship, uh, and the different programs about uh, women support to women? And do they uh, work uh, about uh, for the professional growth of the women? Yeah. Yeah, so we'll start with um, your, your question was how about finding allies? Yeah, how about uh, find allies, uh, how to build uh, a better uh, mentorship and sponsorship program, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how, yeah. Okay, cool. So we'll start with, um, you know, allies and just just so that we're all on the on the same page, um, uh, you know, allyship is is really active, right? To to be an ally, you are actively supporting another individual. It's it's one thing to say, you know, I'm going to sit on the side and I support you in my heart, but I'm not going to do anything. And then you're not necessarily being a full ally. To be an ally, you have to be active in supporting, you know, another individual. Speaking specifically of women, because I know that was, you know, that that was how your question was phrased. I think speaking from my own personal experience, I think I've had, I've been fortunate enough to have a lot of very active male allies in my, you know, my entire life. Uh, you know, my, especially in the last few years of my life. And some of them have been, you know, senior leaders. At other times, they've been peers. Um, sometimes they've been just people in my, you know, extended network who I, you know, turn to for, for active advice and guidance. Um, you know, sometimes when things are going fantastic and at other times when things are, you know, not so great and I really need a different perspective. And I found it to be very, very helpful because they're, you know, they approach things from such a different angle than I normally would. Um, you know, I have a, uh, I have a male partner, my, my fiance, and sometimes, you know, when I'm in a, in a tough situation, I, I, I ask him something or I say something and his perspective is so unique to mine. And it's really refreshing when, you know, you start juxtaposing how different people think about different things. So it's, you know, that's, that's the beauty of diversity. So I, my advice would be actively seek it, you know, actively engage um, with with people across lines of difference, whether that's gender, whether that's race, ethnicity, whether that's, you know, something else, and be that active ally, both you and the other person to help you advance um, and get different perspectives in your in, in your in your life. I think an important piece, um, you know, when it comes to gender um, equality and gender diversity, right? Women, you know, we're we're fifty percent of this world. Um, we're not represented in 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 the workplace to the same extent. Definitely not in in tech, and definitely not in leadership roles, right? Um, and and for us to change that, we do need the active, you know, allyship and support and partnership of our of our male colleagues, right? They need to create that space. They need to call out microaggressions when they happen. They need to keep an eye open to even know that sometimes those things are happening and sometimes they might be perpetuating those stereotypes themselves. So it is a very active role again. So for you know the the, the men on the on the call or the folks who identify as male, um, keep an eye out for those things. Educate yourself. Know what microaggressions are because sometimes they're so subtle that you might not even know that it's happening. But the the your your colleague, um, your female colleague in the room might be experiencing them day in and day out. I call them you know paper cuts. And sometimes it's really you know death by a thousand paper cuts within one day that a woman goes through because of the microaggressions that she faces and she hears so truly you know just educate yourself keep an eye out for it ask questions be curious and understand you know ask questions like how can I do better can I call out microaggressions when they happen what should I be doing differently so that would be one thing that I would say 
um, especially when it comes to you know gender diversity and creating more gender parity in the workplace. Um, and then to your last piece about you know mentorship, coaching, sponsorship, you know all great things. Um, you know, everyone needs to pick and choose what works for them. Um, I personally, um, I'm a huge fan of sponsorship, um, especially when it when you think about it from an organizational perspective at the uh, team or company level. And the reason is because sponsors create access and visibility for you. They are not just they're most likely not even subject matter experts right you're not going them going to them because you have a problem solving code or you're trying to figure out how to do this thing better you're they are there in your life to create access to create visibility for you so essentially a sponsor tends to be you know someone who's more senior than you in the company who has more influence who has more access to information and can unlock you know, doors to which you don't even have keys at the moment, right? So that's their job is to be an advocate. So I'm a, on a personal level, I'm a big uh, proponent for, for sponsorship. In fact, um, I launched, you know, Uber's sponsorship program in, in 2018 um, because, you know, to truly change um, representation in the company and to see more women, women in leadership, we need to create more active sponsors. Um, in, in the organization and sponsors who are truly invested um, in, in the career progression of, of you know, women and under, other underrepresented uh, uh, you know, groups within the organization. So creating that visibility, creating advocacy, um, and really just being there to not just be a sounding board, but to sometimes push you a little bit forward into doing things that you couldn't, you wouldn't do it yourself. Um, so again, Different things work for different people. Sometimes you might need a mentor if you're, you know, if you want subject matter coaching or expertise. Sometimes you might just need a coach, you know, who's, you know, guiding you and making you think differently. But at other times, especially at an organizational level, I believe like having a sponsor, whether it's sent through a formal program or informally, is always very, very beneficial. Okay, you really replied to my next question: How to <laughs> from, uh, how, how to resolve for the broken rank uh, for the women? And uh, sponsorship is a really a tool that uh, yeah. help in this direction, but uh, how to have more women in the pipeline because before uh, the women to be already in the company, uh, we need yeah. to find them and uh, how to support uh, and uh, de develop them uh, to, uh, to be on the role uh, to, on, to get a leadership position or a management position. Yeah, yeah. I think the broken rung is, is really interesting, right? So, so the broken rung, um, it, I think, was from a report earlier this year, right, Raina? From yes. McKinsey's report. Um, yes, exactly. Where, do, you want to, do you want to share what it was for, for, for the audience in case everyone hasn't uh, heard, of, heard of it? Uh, so, so the broken rank, uh, uh, this is uh, the, the effect of the gap between uh, the women that are on uh, engineering or on development uh, first or second level position and uh, the women that are on management position. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So essentially, I think the report found that for every 100 men that is promoted in that are promoted into the first level of management, only 75% of women make it, um, make it there. Yeah, right, like that, this, yeah. some, some, something of like that. So essentially, even in the, the first, you know, step towards leadership roles, we're seeing a huge drop off. Right from a from a gender perspective, for all things equal, um, and that's an issue, right? That's an issue. We have a we have a problem from the very first step, um, and that's really what the broken rung talks about. And 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 speaking to that, you know, some of the things that you know sponsorship, etc., help in creating those vis that visibility um, for young women who are at that at that space in in, in their lives. Um, I think coming to you know the the topic about you know the pipeline um, and it's it's an interesting conversation right the pipeline especially for for certain roles um, might not be 50 50 right and we know that for certain certain positions there isn't um, uh, an equitable or balanced um, uh, pipeline right now but for companies who truly care and truly want to invest in the future 
we need to start doing things that impact right the 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 pipeline 10 15 years from now so going into schools um you know starting with those those the, you know the kids at 10 years old and building um the language and the competency around computer science if we're talking about you know engineering roles from the start right and i actually think it even goes beyond that right when, think about the the times that you go into, I mean, none of us are really going out shopping the way that we used to, but even if you're, you know, think of, you know, back when, when things weren't exactly what they are right now, and you would go to a toy store to, you know, buy, uh, buy a toy for your niece, nephew, your own ch child, um, or, or, or friend's child, um, and how gendered, you know, the, the super, the, the toy store even is, right? The pink aisle for the girls and then the, the GI Joe, NASA, space, pilot, astronaut, whatever aisle for, for the boy. Um, it starts there, right? It starts there. So how, what are we doing um, within our own sphere of influence, right? Within our own lives to start shifting mindsets so that this problem or this pipeline problem that we keep talking about right now isn't what it is 10 years, 15 years from now, because we do need to fix it. We do need to fix it and fixing it really means we have to start um, with with children to make sure that you know in, in 10, 15 years, we don't have only 25% of um, CS graduates who are women. Um, and we have more uh, you know, uh, gender equality um, across that space as well. Thank you. And uh, I uh, would uh, take a chance to add uh, the hot topic uh, the last uh, couple of months. Um, what do you think uh, about the COVID-19 and uh, what is the effect of uh, the COVID-19 on working women and uh, how they deal with uh, the current situation? Is it uh, some problem? Uh, mm -hmm. What is the isolation, uh, working from home? Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, I'd love to ask you, how are you doing right now? <laughs> Before I get into it, like, how have you been doing with, with COVID-19? <laughs> I'm working from home. <laughs> so it's um, a, a very strange in the beginning. Yeah. Um, but uh, now I'm already built my workplace at home. Yeah. And it's uh, quiet. No, there isn't any noise from the the office and the big spaces so uh, yeah yeah and uh, i uh, i think that uh, it's uh, i see the benefit from working from home but uh, i uh, hear from uh, my uh, colleague that uh, they would like to come back uh, to the office uh, because yeah. uh, they have they have the, the kids around them the family etc etc yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. What about you during this um, month? It's 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 been interesting. I won't lie. It's I I think you know I come from I, I you know I'm I'm very very fortunate and very privileged in 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 that you know I have a I have a good job. I have an employer that um, completely understands flexibility and has um, very actively from the start promoted a flexibility, especially for, you know, people with caregiving responsibilities. So whether that's children, whether that's elderly, whether that's a sick partner, whether that's mental health, individual mental health, um, you know, so I'm, I'm very fortunate in that I've, I've had that experience where, you know, we've, we've been able to shut down when you need to create some space for yourself. It's of course very challenging because our, our work is very, very, it's, it's kind of almost always on, but, you know, knowing that you have um, an employer that values um, flexibility and, and is, is willing to really create opportunities for that has been very helpful. But I know that, you know, um, it's, it's been hard, right. Uh, especially for, you know, people who are self-isolating and, you know, by themselves month over month, this thing has been going on for like seven, eight months now. Um, it's, it takes a toll on your mental health and your well-being. And then on the flip side for people with caregiving responsibilities, whether that's young children or elderly or, you know, someone who has, who has um, caregiving needs, it's very, very hard. And, and hearing from our colleagues at Uber, you know, people with, with, with children, especially, homeschooling 
and then being on Zoom 24 seven is, is really, really challenging. There's really no time and space for, for taking care of oneself. And, you know, it's, you know, this pandemic has not been an equal opportunity. It hasn't had impact in, in equal ways, right? It, it has impacted um, underserved and underrepresented groups um, very, very badly. Um, and, and definitely, you know, early reports um, that, that have been published by a few, you know, leading research organizations indicate that, you know, if this goes on and if we're not able to support women in the workplace in the way that is needed, we will see us taking a few steps back into the progress that we've actually made. So already they're, they're, you know, predicting we will have fewer women in leadership roles than we had before because women are in many instances dropping out because of caregiving responsibilities. So, you know, again, we're still in the middle of this right now. It's not over, um, you know, COVID in, in, in different parts of the world is, you know, the lockdowns are coming back up. Um, so it's 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 definitely a, an area of focus and an area of concern is will we actually make will we take a few negative steps um especially in the advancement of women um because of because of the outcomes and because of the situations that we're facing so i think for for organizations you know that that really care about diversity and inclusion and have been making a lot of efforts in advancing women in the workplace, um, they're definitely keeping a, an eye and ear out and trying to fix for that um, before things um, escalate. But absolutely, I think it's an it's definitely, you know, something that um, people are concerned about right now. You know, it's, it's also, you know, we're talking about caregiving and people with, you know, uh, children, etc. But it's, it's also very hard to create visibility opportunities, right, in this, in this moment when you're not in the office, um, and, you know, there aren't that many informal conversations that are happening now because everyone's scheduled <laughs> to Zoom calls. Um, and we know visibility is a very, very important piece of, um, you know, your career development and growth and progression. And, you know, not everyone is, is um, comfortable in, in, you know, self-promotion and creating visibility opportunities for themselves. And in this moment where everything is on Zoom, it's, it again is, is a little hard. So there are definitely quite a few different factors that um, are playing into it. But again, at the flip side, some people, you know, are, are enjoying this, this, this way of working while for others, it hasn't been the most um, easiest few months. Thank you so much for your question, uh, for your answers of my questions. And uh, I believe that uh, our guests uh, also have uh, questions uh, to you. Awesome. Uh, let's see in the chat. Uh, I will share uh, the book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow is awesome. And uh, if you have uh, any question in our head, you can unmute. I have a question, um, if I may jump in. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Vanya. Um, so I know that Uber um, has offices around the world. Um, from diversity and inclusion perspective, do you find differences in how this topic is perceived in each location of, uh, of the company? Thanks, Vanya. That's a, that's a great question. And yeah, the, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, as, 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 you know, someone on the DNI team at Uber, we can't take a one size fits all approach because, um, cultural and regional and national nuances are so specific. So absolutely. I think even what we measure, right. Um, uh, when it comes to representation varies country by country, um, or region by region, but then also the perception, um, you know, differs uh, country by country. So absolutely, as we're having conversations with our teams across the world, 
and even in 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 some of our offices which are extremely diverse like i think our amsterdam office has over 90 different nationalities even if we're just taking nationality as a as a dimension of diversity um and that when we're doing workshops or trainings as an example the conversations are so rich because everyone is coming from their own personal perspective and their lived experience. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think um, th that is definitely one of the, the, the challenges of, uh, you know, of, of, of diversity and inclusion, especially for a global company. But it's also what makes it super exciting because you're, you know, for me, even as, as a DNI practitioner, I'm learning new things every day based off of, you know, the, the groups that I'm talking to or I'm engaging with. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question, Vanya. Uh, so we have a question um, from Eva in the chat. If so many companies are putting uh, so much effort in uh, DNI, why uh, do you think the progress worldwide is uh, so slow? At least uh, that is uh, what uh, data shows. That's a great question, Eva, and it's 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 quite frustrating, right, to see the slow progress that we're making um, as as a society at large, and then to see, especially now, going off of the the previous conversation on COVID, how quickly some of that progress can also be undone. Um, and you know, for, for me, from a from a personal perspective, um, you know, it's. I think that we're not having progress in the way that we would like it to be because I personally don't think we are fixing things at the root. So when we're talking about diversity and inclusion and you know people always say that of course it matters and I care about it and of course you know we should have equal representation of both genders in the workplace and so on and so forth there's a huge gap between intent an actual impact and actual change. And I don't think, and that, that gap there is behavior change, right? And, in, and behavior change is, is frankly one of the hardest things to do. So, you know, companies might change systems and processes and might make them as free from bias as they possibly can. But at the end of the day, most of the decisions that are happening around people are being made by people. Right? And until the behaviors and mindsets shift, we're not going to be seeing progress at a really rapid pace. Um, that's, that's my, my read into it. Um, and that's, that's just, it's really frustrating um, to, to sometimes be in meetings and in, in, in sessions where, you know, people want to say the right things, but they don't want to do the right things because it's easier to say, you know, talk is cheap, actions aren't. Um, so that's, that's my perspective on it. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really, I, I feel positive. Um, I feel really positive, especially when I think about some of the more um, early stage companies uh, that are launching now, hopefully the unicorns of tomorrow, the big you know, companies of tomorrow, who are starting to think about DNI from the starting point, from as they're building that company 50 you know, plus people up, already having conversations on diversity and inclusion, already talking about building inclusive products, already talking about is my product um, or is my service um, being built for just one group of people or is it being built for, for, for access to all? So I'm, I'm, I'm really hopeful. Um, but again, at the same time, I think until we, we really truly change behaviors and we truly, truly look ourselves in the mirror and we say, hey, we are, um, we do have sexist behaviors, or we do have racist behaviors, or we do have racist systems, or we do have sexist systems being built, we're not really ever going to make true meaningful progress at the pace that we want it to be. Yeah, thank you. And uh, another question uh, related to the uh, COVID situation. Is there a new approach uh, managers uh, should implement now during COVID? Uh, anything uh, specifically pay attention to, to make sure they are not uh, depriving people from opportunities, as you mentioned, visibility is less, uh, um, yeah. the personal contact uh, is uh, really limited. Uh, you see your colleague uh, via Zoom or camera, mm -hmm. or you see just a picture. So, yeah. yeah, no, it's a great question. I think first I'll start by saying managing is 
really, really hard, right? Being a people manager is not an easy um, job to do. Um, and then managing in this situation through a crisis, a worldwide pandemic and a crisis is, is really, 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 really hard. So if anyone's a people manager on this call, um, I hope you're taking care of yourself as well, because, um, you know, remember to put that air mask on for yourself before you do it for others, because, you know, you, you need it as well. So I'll start with that. I absolutely, I think you need to, you know, this is, it's, it's a, it's a difficult situation to be in and everyone's dealing with it in, in such a different way. So one is just having that always at the back of your mind that everyone's reaction to what is going on is not going to be the same. Um, and, you know, sometimes on the face of it, someone might look really happy and cheerful, um, but you never know, you know, what's really happening at the, uh, you know, in, in their day-to-day -day life. So just checking in on people. One thing that I've seen um, some managers that I work with do really well is, is creating some of those informal moments, um, uh, you know, and, it, and at times it can seem a little forced because you know you're not in the same office and everyone's on Zoom, but just you know in your in your one one you know and you have to figure out what works for you. There's no you know silver magic bullet on this one. Some people prefer having short check in Some people prefer having a longer check in. But whatever that work, whatever that cadence, whatever that might be for you, it's just create some moment to really ask someone how how are you. Right, just asking them how are you, and then getting an, a response like yeah I'm okay, and then asking that with following that up with like how are you really, right, and then just that simple act of you know asking sometimes reveals a lot of information. Um, so I would say one is one thing that comes to mind is just checking in on people um, and genuinely checking in on them because you really really care. I think the second piece is um, you know. I think kind of goes to creating flexibility and space for individuals, because again, everyone is not dealing with this in the same way and they might have so much stuff going on that you're not aware of. It's just, you know, of course the work has to be done. Um, and, and, you know, that's that's why we're all, you know, in, in organizations to do the work, but creating, you know, less of micromanagement and more of, you know, the work needs to be done and you have the flexibility to do it based on, you know, um, your your individual schedule and you know what is going on in your life um, would would be another thing. And the third is I think you know and the, there's there are many different things that I can I can recall, but I'll, I'll end it on the third one. And it's kind of in your question of as like how do you create those visibility opportunities, right? I, I think as a people manager, you kind of have a understanding of you know the different personalities on your team. You have some people who are more extroverted, some people more introverted, some people who are more um, you know, comfortable being in a forum and going, you know, uh, uh, talking on a topic without, you know, uh, lots of uh, personal thinking time. So you need to kind of know what that personality, uh, the different personalities on your team and what they need to thrive um, and then creating those opportunities for them. Right. So whether it's it's a visibility opportunity that someone might need or someone might deserve or it's space for them to focus and do some thinking work because that's what they need. Having that understanding of your team um, and, and their needs will really help in, in this moment. And then I'll end it with asking, just asking questions before making assumptions on what's going on in others' lives. Just asking that question, is this okay for you? Is it not okay for you? Does this work? Does this not work? Before like jumping to, um, mostly well thought out intentions and uh, and assumptions but don't all you know always ask the questions is what i would say okay so we have the other questions um uh, what's your thinking about the uh, quotas should that be uh, implemented while hiring promoting uh, in companies and uh, could this be seen as a reverse uh, discrimination uh, yeah, and we yeah. have another question, but let's just discuss this one. Okay, sounds good. Um, what do I think about quotas? Um, my personal, my personal perspective um, on on quotas, and I, I think this is, I, I I am in favor of having targets, of having um, meaningful targets and goals that are tailored to the specific need and the specific situation of a team or a company or line of business within a company. Um, so I am definitely in favor of that. It comes with a caveat. 
um, your organization needs to be ready for it, right? If your organization has not built up the foundations and the muscle to understand why you're trying to do what you're trying to do and how you're going to do it, um, then you might have some backlash, right? Um, so that's that's how I would caveat it. So in, in general, in principle, you know, I've seen in many countries, in many boards, they have a quota system and it has worked, right? Um, in general, I'm in favor of, of, of targets because I know most business leaders and businesses like having, you know, a goal, yeah. a numerical goal to, to reach. And I think it, it helps, but it needs to be, it needs to be backed with a foundation that's been built where everyone has a baseline understanding of why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and then going after that target in, in, in a very intentional way so that you know, you're not um, inadvertently creating problems for one group over another. So that's kind of my, my, my read on that. Does that answer your question, Eva? Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. cool. Uh, so, and just uh, back to the previous question about uh, the Manjax and PR answer. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you really think uh, all uh, your staff need to be prepared to get uh, emotionally involved with uh, their managers? And uh, is it easy to be really open and share your emotions and feelings at this moment with the managers? Uh, some people uh, don't want to have this deep and meaningful conversation with uh, the managers or the teammates. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, the other question, uh, I believe it's inspired for your previous answer. Uh, talking about the introverts, do you have any advice uh, on how to include them more effectively? effectively um, because sometimes uh, they tend to isolate themselves too much and uh, during the current uh, situation it's uh, really yeah. forced yeah. yeah thanks so i'll start with the first one from from leslie on mm -hmm. you know do does everyone need to get emotional absolutely not right i think it goes back to my point that there is no one size fits all and everyone has a different approach and everyone needs different things I think creating the opportunity and asking the question is is always a good idea. Um, and then it's you know you you've you've indicated that you're open, but it's on the other person if they want to engage um, in it or not. So absolutely, I I don't think everyone needs to needs to or should or should want to have those those conversations because everyone's comfort level is is very very different and everyone's interpersonal relationship with a team member or with a manager is going to be different but I think creating the the option or creating the space for it um, is is helpful and then it's really on the other person if they want to if they want to engage or not does that help Leslie does that answer the question yes it does but the sometimes people feel you know there's a power imbalance they they report yeah. it in some way and you go what do you really feel they can feel like they have to start having conversations they're not comfortable with so i understand on the one hand it's showing openness and um the ability to care about them as a person and on the other hand some people just feel very very uncomfortable and so i think when you said you ask them how it's going and they go fine. And then you said, well, you're on your response. You know, really, how's it going? I think it can sound very, when you said it, it sounds very welcoming and supportive, but actually I think it can sometimes be a bit aggressive and quite hard for people to deal with depending on their personality. So it answers my question. I think it's a real issue about management on how you treat people as people you care about and people that yeah. you respect, they have different styles. Yeah, no, absolutely, right. And, and, and I think you hit it there. Um, uh, it's hard, but then as 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 a manager or as a teammate, um, you kind of have to meet people where they are, right? So when I said you ask, "How are you doing?" and you know, follow it up with, "How are you really doing?" Um, you know, you don't. Of course, I'm not saying you have to use that language verbatim, um, but the intention is that you're creating that space for someone, um, bearing in mind the the power imbalance bearing in mind that you know people have different comfort levels and different needs um 
but really creating the space and, and giving the invitation to, to, to people on your team. Yeah, great. Right. Thanks, Thanks for the question though. And uh, the second question was uh, yeah. about the introverts and uh, do you have any advice how to include them more effectively in the team? Um, because sometimes they tend to isolate themselves too much in uh, normal situation and now especially. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's a good question. Are, I'm curious, are there any, any introverts on, on this call who, who are willing to like say, yes, you don't have to, but I'm just curious if, if there are any on this, on this call. Yeah, I could say I am. I am one. <laughs> Hi, Ritika. Hi. <laughs> um, do you have any, do you have any advice on this one before I jump in? Uh, no, I'd like to actually hear what your advice is here. <laughs> <laughs> cool. It's, it's interesting. This is, it's, it's such a good question. And I am, I am not an introvert. I'm more of a, um, an, an ambivert. I, I'm fairly comfortable in, I, I'm mostly perceived as an extrovert, but I, I do prefer a lot of downtime and alone time and thinking time. Um, but I can, I can navigate the two. Um, but it's, it's an interesting question because I actually have an introvert on, on my team, an extremely introverted um, person on my team. And, you know, we've, we've, we've formed a very, very good relationship over the past few years that I've been working with him. And it's, you know, my, my advice, it's, it's, I don't want to generalize, um, you know, on, on my advice on how to include them more effectively. But again, it, it kind of goes back to there is no one size fits all and it's trying to find out what you can do to help and support them and to create that visibility for them where they're comfortable so it's going to be in my experience it is going to be different for 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 different people what i have um what i've done personally in a few instances and i've seen this you know this this advice help other you know people managers in in, in my organization as well is is ask that question right like what works best for you um what are your what are your goals how, where do you want to go in the next 6 months 12 months whatever the time frame is and how can i be that bridge in helping you get there and then working you know it's almost like you're you're entering a contract or an agreement with that other individual and cons and and you know having that opportunity to check back whatever that frequent cadence might be that works for both of you or, or, or the broader team on making that more effective and efficient for them. That's, that's what I've seen um, work quite, quite often. Personally, um, for me, as someone who is not very introverted, you know, I've, I spent some time trying to, you know, learn a little bit more um, on, on what works as well. There's a book called Quiet, which some of you might have read uh, by Susan Cain, which for me was quite interesting um, because it, it spoke about, um, you know, introverts in a, in a world that can't stop out talking, I believe is, is the ta tagline. And it really puts um, being an introvert into the business context. And it's just a really great read that helped me um, in many ways, you know, as, 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 as a people manager understand um, how I could better navigate, um, navigate some of that. Um, there are a few other tools as well, uh, depending on depending on your you know your companies that you work at um, that have have been driven, um, just understanding different personality types and and understanding you know how one person thrives and what situation one person thrives versus another because it eventually does boil down to a lot of interpersonal you know communication and comfort and just awareness um, of, of each other. But my broad, very general advice would be enter into that, have that conversation. Um, and it of course doesn't happen on day one, especially if you're just forming a relationship, but enter into that conversation and show the intent from your side and, um, and almost build that agreement out, right? On, on what's going to be more effective for you and how can I um, help make that happen? Does that help? Yes, it is very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, it is uh, exactly what I was trying to do with uh, with with my colleagues in the works, but uh, 
uh, like you said, it, it doesn't always work that way for for yeah. everyone. There's no there's no one size fits all. Yeah. But but well, it works with with some people. Thank you. Very yeah. Much. You're welcome. We did something quite recently. It's actually funny. Uh, it was an interesting, um, uh, you know, I'm guessing most of you organize like off sites. Well, no one's going really off site anymore, but you know, virtual, virtual off sites or on sites or summits or whatever you call them. And, um, you know, we, we more recently, we had someone who was more introverted on our team actually plan one of our sessions. And it was so interesting to see, um, you know, how that session was planned and and the activity that they actually chose for us to do and one it, it was it was actually a very very extroverted activity that that individual chose for for us to do as, as a fun activity on our team it was it was quite interesting to see how some of those pieces came together but yeah i'm just just sharing um something that happened more recently in our on our team mm -hmm. I believe that we haven't any other questions for you. Thank you so much for your answer. And uh, if you would like uh, to say something closer, some uh, something for um, before I close our event. Sure. Thanks, Raina. Thank you all for um, for for the questions and for joining. Um, this was such a it was it, it's a it's a nice small group. So I I you know I I was very very transparent and honest with my personal perspectives and and opinions and and learnings and experiences. Um, but really, if if you know any of you would like to continue the conversations or have different perspectives, I'm always list you know open for feedback and to to listen. So please feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, very very informally um i think in closing you know one thing that's that's kind of been on my mind and i i shared them more, this more recently at another conversation that i had was about inclusion and how intentional the act is of of being inclusive um and again you know most of us 99% of the time have good intentions and we want to do the right thing um but if you're not intentional about it um, and you're not taking in those different perspectives, there's a high chance that, you know, you're not being inclusive. You're actually, you know, being, you're excluding one group over another. So I think my, my parting words would be, be intentional about um, inclusion. Um, because if you're not, then most likely, you know, you're, you might be excluding one group over another. And um, yeah, uh, just that, that for me, uh, you know, it, it comes with effort. It comes with a lot of work. Um, it comes with a lot of thoroughness and thought that goes into it. But in the long run, you know, in those simple acts that we do every single day is when we build inclusion, right? Asking someone, you know, how their day has been going, if, if you're at that um, comfort level with them, um, you know, seeing when someone hasn't had an opportunity to speak on a call, just checking in on the site saying, hey, notice you've been quiet just wanting to make sure that you had the opportunity to talk, seeing that someone's unmuted in between a call, but then muted back again. And because they haven't had the opportunity to speak, you know, just keeping an eye out for some of these smaller gestures, um, especially in this really virtual world, um, really helps in, you know, people feeling um, a sense of inclusion in their in their day to day lives. So I think I'll, I'll just end off with, you know, inclusion is requires a lot of intentionality would be my last my closing words but thank you all so much for joining and Raina thank you for the for the questions and th thank you Rashi and it was a pleasure for me to be here this uh, evening and thank you Eva for uh, found Rashi for our event uh, so uh, my last words is uh, let's to be more inclusive and uh, Stay tuned for our next event. Thank you, Thank Eva. You Thank much. you, Raina. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.